Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Allison, for hitting that record button. My name is Bonnie Perez Ramirez, and I am with Partners Resource Networks Pen Project. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about PRN before we get started with the fabulous ladies that are joining us today. Um, Partners Resource Network is a nonprofit agency that operates as Texas statewide network of parent training and information centers. And we work with parents of children and youth with disabilities, zero to 26 years of age. And we also work with youth self-advocates, ages 14 to 26. The PTIs across the United States are funded by the U.S. Department of Education Office of Special Education Programs. And our mission is to empower and support our Texas families and individuals impacted by disabilities or special health care needs. And we do that by providing information, referrals, and um, workshops and webinars such as this one. And the most beautiful part about all of this is that all of our services are free. And I'm very grateful to have um, to join, be joining um, Allison and Ms. Heidi today um, for a very, very important topic. And I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to, to you ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bonnie. It's always a pleasure to be back with you. Allison Scobar, Care Consolidated Planning Group. Um, I always start off with a few housekeeping items. So we are in webinar mode today in case anybody's wondering and don't use uh, Zoom very often. So webinar mode basically means that we can't see you or hear you, but we do know you're there. Um, as we go through our presentation today, it is being recorded and you will get a copy of today's slides as well as a link to the recording after the fact. So um, just uh, be aware of that. We invite you to put your questions in the chat box as we um, go throughout today. I'll be monitoring that chat box and reading those questions out to Heidi. And we are going from 12 to 1 today. So if you're planning your lunch hour, you can plan that we will be finished by 1 o'clock. So Consolidated Planning Group, we are a holistic special needs financial planning firm. We help people um, plan for the future of their loved one with a disability by putting protection plans in place, lifetime care plan, transition planning. We help set up ABLE accounts, and we do a lot of advocacy just like this um, by these webinars. Um, I'm a parent myself, so I eat, sleep, and breathe this both personally and professionally. And I myself felt frustrated when we were transitioning into adulthood with our own kids because I know this stuff, and it was difficult. I'm just telling you, it was hard. So if you're feeling that way, you're certainly not alone. And these webinars are designed to put the tools and tips in your pocket that you need to be successful for free. So we are super, super excited to be here today with Heidi Angel, and she is going to be um, talking to us about planning for the future, wills, trust, and guardianship. Heidi, thanks so much uh, for being here with us today. Thank you, Allison. And likewise, I appreciate both of you two ladies and organizations that you represent that provide this information to families, because just like Allison said, I have a child uh, with a disability. And so for me, it, it matters a lot to me. It matters personally to me that parents who are going through these stages of life have accurate information. It's a very stressful time, or it can be a stressful time. And some of that stress is created by hearing lots of bits of information, um, and some, some of which may pertain to your own personal situation and some of it might not. And so, you know, my, my goals for today really are to provide an overview to you. And the reason for this, you know, of different legal issues that are affecting uh, individuals with disabilities and especially with regard to their, you know, rights to public benefits uh, eligibility. Um, and mainly just so that you can be good consumers of legal services, for one, that's that's one of my goals. I want to give you enough information so that when you're going out to, you know, hire an attorney or uh, look into the legal services that you may need, that you can be a good uh, consumer of those services, but also so that you can go come alongside other advocates and self-advocates being aware of what the law is, uh, how those laws affect people with disabilities, how they've changed over time, and how you can be a part of you know, those changes as they come about. And we have to be fairly knowledgeable to be able to be effective as advocates and to come alongside people who have been advocating. 
Um, so th those are really my main my main purposes and the goals here today. Um, so I guess I'll jump right into guardianship and just what I'd like to do, like I said, is give you just some legal structure. Some of you are coming from a place of no knowledge about guardianship. Maybe you've been told, uh, maybe you have a 17-year-old in school and you've been told by your uh, ARD committee that they must be put under guardianship or, or you're not going to be able to come to their ARD meetings. Maybe you are in a medical situation where the doctors or the hospital has said you won't be able to make medical decisions for your soon-to-be adult child uh, without having them be under a guardianship. And so what all does that mean? What does that process look like? Are there alternatives? How do you decide which path to take? So that, that's where we're starting from here. So what is guard, guardianship? It is a, it's a statutory framework. It's in the Texas Estates Code. Um, in which uh, a court will appoint an individual to have legal authority over the personal, financial, medical decisions of a person who's been determined to be unable to make those decisions. So um, in some scenarios, that's you know an elderly person that may be vulnerable to abuse or neglect, and a family member or an interested person may apply for a guardianship in order to help make medical decisions for them and financial decisions. Um, in many of those cases, it is a it's a financial exploitation that is of primary concern, and so there's a guardianship set up to manage assets and to protect that person from being exploited financially. Um, for many of our kids who are about to turn 18, sometimes it's more of the guardianship of the person side, where they're needing someone to make medical decisions for an individual who's turning 18 and does not have the capacity to make those medical decisions for them for themselves. So Heidi, um, you know, a lot of parents come to this, you know, one would argue that most kids that are turning 18 <laughs> are not there yet, right? You know, we, we hear a lot of times that, um, you know, this is a pretty stressful decision on guardianship to, to have guardianship or not and those types of things. Um, one of the things that we are always sharing with um, families is they don't have to know they don't have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is what has to happen. Um, we really invite families to partner, to, to go meet with an attorney, someone like yourself, and sit down and kind of talk through what the different options are, because I think some, some families are really stressing over this. Um, and, and I know you're going to kind of talk about kind of what the law says as it regards to guardianship. Um, but can you can you talk to some families? Uh, can tell us about uh, about that? What they can expect if if you're a parent that just doesn't really know. You know they need some help, but you're not crystal clear, and you need some guidance. Because I think some people avoid going to see the attorney because they have those question marks, as opposed to working through it with you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like you said, I mean, most people who have an 18-year-old, a typically developing 18-year-old, if they were given the opportunity to get guardianship over them and continue making legal decisions for them beyond age 18, they probably would think that sounds like a good idea. So I think as parents of kids who have intellectual disabilities, we have to be really cautious to not fall into that just because it's available to us, because it may not be necessary. There may be some maturity that needs to be gained, some communication skills that need to be gained, and just some, some you know, aging a bit. That's not always the case. So I'm, we're speaking to, Allison and I are trying to provide this information while we realize that we are speaking to a very broad section of the community and dealing with a lot of different diagnoses and situations. So bear with us in trying to answer questions clearly, but also with many, many different situations in mind. Um, but, you know, understanding what the process looks like, understanding that, you know, when someone turns 18, a, if a doctor, the doctor that this child has been seeing says, you know, you, we cannot allow this individual to continue um, being treated here in this hospital beyond age 18 without there being a guardianship in place, because there is not a person who has the authority to make medical decisions and consent to medical treatment on their behalf without there being a legal guardianship in place. Um, and so that, that's often where, where it begins. And so for the parents and the families who are thinking about you know, whether this is necessary, sometimes my, my initial question is, well, who are the gatekeepers that are asking for this? You know, is there a gatekeeper that has stopped you from doing something or, or might stop you? If, that, if the answer to that is the physician is saying, there's no more medical treatment, then that's a, 
that's a real concern and that that means that a guardianship may be necessary. Sometimes, however, it might be, you know, just someone in a school and they just aren't informed um, or any type of setting that just they're not as informed about the nuances about guardianship and alternatives to guardianship. And they might just kind of throw it out there. And that's where we're coming in trying to say, okay, let us give you a really good explanation of what guardianship looks like when it's appropriate, when there's some alternatives so that you can kind of put all of these puzzle pieces together and try to start getting to a conclusion that works best for your family. And it is very nuanced. So that's why we're, we're walking through all these different options, but just sort of to give you an idea why guardianship, someone's over the 18, age of 18 and does not have capacity to consent to medical treatment or manage their financial affairs. Um, and then just the two different types, I've kind of touched on them a little bit. Guardianship of the person is what it sounds like. It is making decisions for you know daily living, uh, med consent to medical treatment and that sort of thing. And then guardianship of the, the estate is only needed if there are assets. So if there are, um, if the individual who's incapacitated has assets, then a guardianship of the estate might be sought in order to take control of those assets for the benefit of that person with court supervision so that uh, they're to protect that individual from exploitation, financial exploitation. Can we can we talk about isn't there something and I'm not a code specialist by by any stretch of the imagination, um, but like least restrictive, most appropriate, like is there some kind of wording? Can you talk about that and what that means to folks? Yeah, when I hear at least restrictive, uh, I start thinking about in our IEPs, right? We want to have them in a least restrictive environment in school, but that sort of continues that same sort of thinking that you want the least restrictive alternative to guardianship and so or a less restrictive alternative alternative to guardianship. So where guardianship removes the war, the proposed war, the individual's civil rights, their right to make these decisions, if there is a less restrictive alternative, that would be like a supported decision making agreement. And we'll get into some of what some of those alternatives are. But with guardianship being the most restrictive way to protect someone, right? Taking away their rights is an extremely restrictive way to protect someone. We want to make sure that it is the best and only option available to that person. So if we can find any other supports and services, um, alternatives to guardianship, anything else that can avoid the need for guardianship, we absolutely want to seek those first. We have two quick questions. One says, um, will the PCP be the one to guide us as to what type of guardianship is needed? Sometimes. So when we're looking at guardianship, we're looking at the threshold question of incapacity. So a medical professional will be the one that will make that incapacity determination. And it will probably be the primary care doctor. Occasionally, it's a neurologist or some sort of specialist that really um, understands the character of the diagnosis of the individual. And so in those cases, you know, that person might be more, might be better suited to answering the questions. What's going to be submitted to the court is a CME, a certified medical examination. And that is going to list, you know, diagnosis and prognosis and uh, will this change? Does this, is this person fully or partially incapacitated? So the physician that will fill out that form, uh, that's the form that will be utilized with the application for guardianship with the court and which will be some of the evidence that will be presented to the court to determine that incapacity. Now, whether it's a guardianship of the person or the estate, the PCP wouldn't have any uh, knowledge about that. That would be just a determination of what, you know, whether or not that person has assets that need to be protected as well. And um, someone else posted um, a, a great question because we've seen a lot of this since um, COVID. What about mental health? So maybe the person doesn't have an intellectual disability, but maybe they have the alphabet soup of mental health, uh, borderline personality disorder, bipolar. We've seen, you know, we've seen a lot of stuff in um, over the last few years. So is there a line for that if we have a loved one with mental health challenges? Yeah, and that's a great question and a really tough question. I, I, I get it quite a bit. So handling guardianships, I often will get the call. Um, you know, we have this individual. We're very concerned about this individual being a danger to themselves, maybe a danger to others. Um, and we think that they need to be restricted in some way. And we want to file for a guardianship immediately. Um, and unfortunately, my answer to that is 
it, it may not fall within guardianship. So guardianship is very specific to um, being intended to protect the, the individual with an intellectual disability or dementia, some sort of, some sort of um, intellectual disability. It is not intended as a mental health type of commitment. That is a, a mental health commitment is a different type of law, a different area of law entirely. Um, although it does present in a way that seems to overlap, right? But the mental health can change over time. The intellectual disability, you know, doesn't change necessarily. And so there, there are two different types of law. The mental health uh, issues and the mental health commitment, which is usually kind of the analogous concept to guardianship, the entry points are, you know, typically the criminal, uh, from a criminal perspective. So if someone's a danger to themselves or others, it might be a call to 911 or to adult protective services or, you know, something along that line. So there ends up being a, a criminal component to it. Um, unfortunately, right? I mean, there, there, I wish there were a better solution with regard to mental health. The other side of it is sometimes it's a medical entry point into mental health commitment or mental health support through either our county hospitals or, or any kind of medical center or our mental health agencies in town, but it, it, there definitely is a very um, strong line between the two, between mental health commitment and between guardianship, and the purposes of both of those are, are distinct. Now, where you would have them overlapping, if someone has an intellectual disability, they may um, be able to be put under guardianship, or, um, but where it's just mental health, typically no. Heidi, um, I just wanted to mention, I've seen a, a few where there has been guardianship under the mental health, where there is clear psycho long, long history and multiple admissions and all kinds of the other things that you were talking about. I definitely have seen um, seen that throughout my practice um, um, through the years. But I think basically what you're saying is it's kind of a slippery slope. It's not as, it is not as clear as some of the other ones might be, um, <clears throat> but clear documentation and working very closely with those doctors. I mean, there are people that are adults that need help, um, you know, emotionally and things like that. And, and, and for a period of years, they haven't been able to do that. So just, you know, just know that, it, you know, I think the clear documentation is important. Another person said, um, is guardianship only for children with IDD or um, DD or ED, or can can we as a family member um, decide this for the child with other kinds of disabilities? There, I mean, there's many different kinds of disabilities, not just intellectual disability, where a person may, um, you know, need need this. Is that right, Heidi? So, with you know. There are certainly many types of disabilities where individuals need support, for sure. But where it falls in the realm of guardianship is a place where that individual's need um, is something that they are unable to express and acquire for themselves, right? And so it is one where going into sort of pros of guardianship right here on the next slide. So if you have an individual who is vulnerable to abuse, neglect, or exploitation, and they are unable to get the services and supports that they need um, to be protected and safe, and they're over the age of 18, then a guardianship is likely an appropriate uh, route for their protection. Um, their support supervision, the, you know, the guardian has to file an annual report. And so there's ongoing supervision, there's a court investigator. There are times when this really is a necessary and helpful protection for an individual who's vulnerable. Um, where someone has a, a disability, but they can speak or communicate, you know, express their wants and desires on their own, if they're able to do that with support, then a guardianship isn't appropriate for them. They're, they, you know, they may still need a lot of support, but it isn't necessarily the type of support that a guardianship um, should be utilized to provide. Um, and, you know, that kind of leads into the next slide, which is, you know, cons of guardianship, and that's that guardianship is the most restrictive action that can be taken, taken to protect a vulnerable person. And so with that, it should be the last and best option. So it should be, you know, pretty clear that this person needs that for a couple of reasons. One, we need to be very careful about removing someone's um, civil rights, you know, in, in, the, in the first place. Secondly, 
I don't want to take somebody to court and get a guardianship denied. I haven't done that yet. It happens. Um, so when I'm talking to a new client, that's one of the questions. You know, I don't, I do not want you to spend your time and money and energy, which is in high demand when you have a child with the with a disability that you're supporting. Um, I don't want to waste any of those resources going to court and applying for guardianship and it getting denied because it wasn't clear that there was enough evidence that you're that the individual really is incapacitated. And so, you know, we look at that CME, the examination that the doctor provides and what their opinion is. We look at whether the doctors will continue to provide medical treatment to this child without someone being put into place as a guardian to consent to medical treatment. We take all these factors into consideration before we would apply to, to the court for a guardianship. Um, because as you look at these other cons, I mean, you do, you have a court involved with your life. There's a court investigator. Again, this can be very protective to certain people. But it, there's a downside to it. You know, you have someone involved in your life. I don't necessarily want a court involved with my life unless there's a good reason for it. Um, like we've talked about the ward, that's the person who's under guardianship, loses many of their basic rights. Um, it's costly hiring, hiring an attorney. I mean, it's almost $1,000 just in court fees and for filing, criminal background checks, all of those things. Um, I try to, you know, give a good estimate to people of what I think it will cost, but it's usually around four. $4,000, four to $5,000. So it's not an inexpensive um, thing. Now there are some um, pro bono guardianship services out there. That's something to consider for somebody that might be eligible for some of those. I know tech, our, locally our Texas A&M Law School has a guardianship clinic. So there's some eligibility for those. So keep that in mind. But um, absent being eligible for one of those, it is a private attorney that you're hiring to go through the process with you. And it's necessary because um, an evidentiary hearing has to be put on. It's not just submitting paperwork. You go for a hearing and you put on evidence and you have to show that the guardianship is necessary. And so that leads into my next, the guardianship process is my next slide. So you file an application. Uh, can, can, we, can we just talk just for a second about what about the families that really truly should have had guardianship, but they didn't? Because we've actually seen that as well, where the person did have an intellectual disability. They did not have capacity to make decisions for themselves. They could not handle finances. And we've actually seen sad situations where this wasn't in place, or mom or dad died, or mom and dad both died, and the individual was an adult and living with them, and then became a ward of the state. And those examples, like, can you talk about that too? Because I think there's a fine line. We've had that happen. And we've also seen where um, there was a power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney in place, but it was signed by an individual who did not have the capacity to sign it and it was refused in a medical setting. It was denied. So I, I want, because I, I, I do think that there are some that are kind of really, really important. And I think if we have aging, if we're aging ourselves and what if we're not here? One question that comes to my mind is, can your loved one, can they, you know, can they live alone? You know, we have some families that can't leave their, their loved one alone at all. Maybe it's a short period of time. They can't handle finances and other things like that. So talk to us about that side really quick. Okay. So I think I got a, caught a couple of questions, but let me know if I didn't, don't answer it. So one was, um, a guardianship's never set up and this individual appears to have needed to be under guardianship and there isn't one and maybe parents have passed or maybe there's no family support there. Um, any interested person can file an application for the for, for guardianship. And again, that court's going to go through this process where they're going to um, determine, you know, the incapacity determination will be made, whether there really is a necessity for guardianship, which means there aren't any avail alternatives available, and whether the person who is um, promoting themselves as the guardian is an appropriate person. So there are some professional guardians out there if there's no family. There are professional guardians out there that can serve. Um, so there are, there's still, the process is still available even if the family members aren't the ones who do that. Um, the other question you asked was about somebody that has a power of attorney but didn't have capacity really to sign it. So, you know, when I'm doing a typical set of estate planning documents for a client who has capacity, or just an adult with capacity, you know, we do a will and we do their power of attorney documents because that's, you know, protection for them in the future if they were to lose capacity in the car, some sort of accident or something happens to them, 
and they lose capacity, then they have named an agent to make those decisions for them and importantly, avoid the need for guardianship entirely. And so it's a really part, really important part of our own estate planning is to set, set up those power of attorney documents. So then if you lose capacity, you've got that agent, you don't have to go through a guardianship. Um, in an instance where, you know, someone may have their child sign over a power of attorney to them, but really that child never had um, capacity to do so, then it is very likely to not be accepted somewhere because, you know, especially with a doctor or financial institution that um, recognizes the, the limitations that this person might have, they, they would know that that person was, you know, asked to sign a legal document, they didn't have the legal capacity to do so. And so it is ineffective. People, you know, sometimes people will do that. Um, on the flip side, I, I have people with intellectual disability sign powers of attorney when they appear to me to have the capacity to do so. And those are difficult. Um, sometimes I'm having to, you know, promote that that's actually accurate, that this individual has some communication differences, maybe some physical limitations. Um, but they are they do understand what this legal document says in front of them and are able to put whatever signature they use down. So that determination of, of incapacity is, is it's a difficult one. It's it's not black and white. Maybe you know, for a neurologist, someone with a higher level of understanding of that type of thing, maybe it is, but for the rest of us, uh, it, it's a difficult determination. We have one more thing in the chat box before we move on. And, and this is something I have to say comes up in our practice every week. What about these high fu functioning kids? Maybe they're on the au autism spectrum, high functioning, we got ADHD, some of those brain, you know, differences. Um, do you have a recommendation for those families or for those families that we say, hey, our kids aren't there yet, but we're hopeful and optimistic of where they're getting? Is that where you would lean more towards that power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney and supported de decision making agreement for those families? Absolutely. I would for several reasons. I mean, like you touched on, um, that they may mature over time and be able to, you know, take care of these items also because typically they're not incapacitated. They're neurodiverse, right? They might need a lot of support and they might need the rest of us to listen and understand better, but they aren't likely incapacitated. And, and again, with time and with supports um, in place, they, they likely don't need to go through guardianship. Now, I would also say that in any way that you can, you know, and we'll talk about special needs planning here in a minute, but if you can give that person the support of having, you know, not having a lot of financial assets, if they're not capable of taking care of those, if those could be held in a trust or something for their benefit, there's some ways to just make sure you're providing good support. And also if, so someone could have, could be, you know, disabled per the definition um, under the social security administration and that might not they might not have an intellectual disability or they might also have an intellectual disability but that determination would have to do with whether they might be eligible for public benefits and so there's reasons uh, for their eligibility to do the special needs planning in addition to that providing some support to them to maybe avoid guardianship so both could be at play um could you talk about um a person that was maybe under guardianship because it was totally necessary at age 18, but maybe age 28 or 30, it's no longer necessary. And um, the parents are in agreement, the kid is in agreement of getting um, getting their rights back. Um, so it, I guess, you know, and, and, and I would like to just preface and say, you know, it's the opinion of, you know, whatever attorney or law firm you're working with, you know, some people are pro guardianship, some people are anti-guardianship and somewhere in between, and that's not necessarily right or wrong. That's been our experience and, you know, the different firms that we've, that we've worked with, but, but let's talk about getting their rights back. Um, because all of the evidence at age 18 was crystal clear that the guardianship was needed, but things went well since then. It's 10 years later, whatever. The kid's doing great. Talk, can you tell us about that? Yeah, and I'll just add to your fact pattern there that, you know, legislation has changed. We have more alternatives to guardianship. We understand, you know, the rights of people with disabilities. We re realize how ableist so many of our laws were. So a lot has changed with regard to guardianship since, you know, maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago when a certain individual might have been put under guardianship. So they might have changed, but also the system has changed and our perceptions of disability, I believe, have changed significantly. 
So yes, there's a lot of restorations going on. So where people's rights are restored and the guardianships are eliminated, those are happening um, more and more. Um, it used to be, you know, not, let's say prior to 2015, you could file an application for guardianship and walk in and barely prove anything up. You'd show up, show the CME and walk out with your letters of guardianship. If it was a parent and there was no contest and it was a child with a disability, there was really, it was a fairly low bar um, now we do have to put on an evidentiary hearing. There is a much higher standard and that is a double-edged sword. So it is wonderful. Uh, and it was a goal of advocates to make sure that there's due process here and that the rights of wards are protected, rights of people with disabilities are protected and they're not, their rights aren't taken away without due process of law and evidence and reasons for that it should be. Um, on the flip side, it's really tough on parents who know that their kid needs guardianship. Now they've got it, you know, they have to, it's costly. It's a whole process that it, it used to not be. And there's some legislation right now that should be voted on within the next week, currently in Texas. So if you're not in Texas, sorry, it doesn't apply, but it could apply to some people's states. Um, there's legislation to have an independent guardian uh, where if it's a parent coming in, they can apply for guardianship and it's a really simple process, very little evidence is uh, is needed and it's it's a lot less costly. I like the I like that process for some situations, but it absolutely is dangerous for taking away people's rights uh, without due process. Unfortunately, that's the flip side to that make to making that an easier process for parents. So there there is no there's no perfect system. I, the system is difficult. My job is you know to try to explain it, work within it, protect people, and and try to provide the clearest information that I can about it. So, um, but yes, to answer your question, there are quite a few restorations going on at this point. And I have seen, like, I, I have seen that um, a lot of the physicians are definitely not flippant. If they were flippant about it before, they're not now about signing these CMEs. It is a big deal for a physician to sign off on that physician certificate saying, yes, I agree that this individual should have their rights taken away. And I would just suggest to you, they do not take that lightly. And so this is going to be a physician, a medical doctor that you have um, worked with for years. It might be the, the, the age old pediatrician. It might be, like she said, it might be other specialists because a lot of our kids see specialists and I've seen it be a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Um, but I, I would say over the last few years, I've seen that this is not, this is not dealt with lightly. You can't just expect that you're just going to sail in there, especially if you have a kid on the high functioning autism or ADHD, ADHD zone, or especially somebody that doesn't have an intellectual disability. It doesn't mean they won't sign off on it. It just means that they take this, um, responsibility very seriously. And then that next layer takes it very seriously too. So you could have a doctor who says this individual is totally incapacitated and needs a guardianship and the court may disagree. And so you've got a couple of levels there of evidence that's, that have, are being, uh, that evidence is being promoted to try to come up with the right solution there. Yeah, and not over overdo it. All right, so the application process, we've talked a little bit about that. Um, my next slide just refers to letters of guardianship that are, that's the authority that a guardian receives. It's a piece of paper, almost like a certificate that uh, is issued to the guardian so that they can show that and say, you know, I have the authority as the guardian to make these decisions for this ind individual. Each year, the guardian has to file an annual report that just updates the court on the status of the ward who's under guardianship. And sometimes the court will send out uh, their court investigator to make sure that the ward who's under guardianship is being well taken care of, that they are, uh, they will go so far as to, you know, look into the activities that the person is in, involved with and suggest to the family if they aren't getting them out enough that maybe they're insulated a bit in their home and they need to be out more doing some daily activities or even maybe a, a day hab program or something like that. And so, um, any, any changes to residents or anything must be reported to the court in that annual report. Uh, and if you move to a different county, the, the guardianship has to be transferred, certainly to a different county, different state, the guardianship has to be transferred. And so that's a process. Um, can, can we talk about the CME, um, uh, just this last, um, this last slide for a second, because there's something to, um, 
how how old the C, the physician certificate. There's a, a, a time period like where. Can we talk about that? Yeah. So you can file. Let's see. I haven't thought about this for a minute. It's uh, you can file the application for guardianship, and the CME has to be 180. It's 180 or 120 days. Uh, fresh, basically, within that amount of time before filing the application for guardianship. So it can't be. Okay, yes. And I think I was thinking that 120. I don't know that for sure, but I was thinking it was um, definitely 120 was what I was thinking. So yeah. in my head. Yeah. Um, and someone says, is it possible for both parents to have guardianship? So a mar if they're married, they can be joint guardians. Um, if they're not married, then no. Um, otherwise, it's just just a one guardian. And the one thing that you said on here, and I think this is a misnomer that people, you know, really don't know uh, that that moving to a different count, county that's a big deal. So you could live in the same state of Texas and move to a different county, or maybe mom still lives in one county, and then we put. The, your loved one in a, you know, a, a residential living facility that might be in a different county. And that example, would you need to transfer it to the county and where the individual is living? Likely. And it might be, you know, in that annual report updating the court, you know, that we've, you know, the, the ward is now living at this other place. And so if it's in a different county, you know, just is the court going to demand that the guardianship is changed? transferred to the new county where they're living? Does, is it a different county than where the guardian is? So they'll take that into account. Um, but the, count, the, the guardianships are county specific. And so in selecting an attorney, you want to make sure you're selecting an attorney who practices in that county court um, because they are, they are all quite different. Um, and some of them are, you know, statutory probate courts, and some of them are county courts at law. They're just very different. So you want to make sure you find an attorney that practices in that particular county court. Okay. And so this question comes up every um, every time, and I'm thank you for putting this in the chat box. Um, could you elaborate more on a single parent situation or a divorce situation um, on how that might might work? So there's various levels on that, right? So sometimes it's a divorce situation where um, the ex-spouse parent doesn't want to have anything to do with this. And so they'll just sign a waiver and say, yes, please, please ex-spouse go forward. You have, you know, care and control of the, our child. Please move forward with the guardianship. I'm waiving my rights to serve as guardian and have notice of the proceeding and you can go forward. So that's really typical. Another scenario is, you know, ex-spouse is nowhere to be found, other parent nowhere to be found. And so we have to just go through our procedures that are outlined in the Texas, uh, in Texas law so that we can, you know, either notice them by publication or serve them with notice by certified mail. And um, there's a couple of different ways we can do that depending on, you know, what the situation is. But we just have to be able to show the court that we have done our best to notify the other parent, to give them an opportunity to speak up about the guardianship to, to serve as guardian if they would like to that sort of thing um if it's contested if they said it's the next scenario it would be where the ex-spouse or the other parent does not think there should be a guardian does not think that the person their child should be under guardianship and they may contest it and then again it's just a it's a matter of evidence it's a lawsuit and it's a matter of evidence and you know there's evidence regarding incapacity there's a evidence regarding whether there's a necessity for guardianship and then there's the qualification of the individual applying to be the guardian. And so it just depends on which one of those or all of those, if they are contesting, um, if they are not, if they are not suggesting that they serve as the guardian, if they just don't like the other parent serving as guardian, then I don't know how far they'll get in that. But. So in an example of a divorce situation and one parent has custody of the child, but they have joint managing conservatorship or what have you um is there a such thing as joint guardianship once the child turns 18 in divorce situations or does one or the other need to be selected yeah there's not there wouldn't be a joint um, with ex-spouses also it's important to note that age 18 that suit affecting the parent-child relationship part of the divorce decree it ends at age 18 or, you know, it has the language in it of 18 or finishes high school or joins the military. I think those are the ones. So 
that part, the possession part, usually ends. And then if there is ongoing child support for life, uh, that could continue, but it would not have a bearing on who the guardian is. And then I think you do get into some interesting guardianship law, family law issues where you have an adult child with a disability. So the family code, you know, I'm not a family law attorney. It'd be interesting to have a conversation between the two. You know, guardianship is typically the over 18, you know, um, care and control of this individual who needs that support. And the, you know, child, they're not a child any longer. So that those family code sections don't apply. So <clears throat> real quick on this one. Um, so if we have a parent has guardianship over an adult child and the adult child is trying to emancipate themselves to, the, to end the guardianship, can the um, same attorney represent the adult child? And is that a question on like if, if, every, if everybody's in agreement, could the same attorney um, represent both parties? And if there is a disagreement between what should happen, then would they need separate attorneys? How does that work? Definitely a separate attorney between the guardian or applicant for guardianship and the, I think you're saying the child. And usually that one would be a court appointed attorney for the child. They're protecting their rights and their interests. And certainly those are always different. Okay, perfect. We're going to keep moving. I will, we'll talk about the trust rep payee when you're no longer here in a few minutes. Okay. To yes, kind of hit on the last available choice here. Yes. Yeah. So, and again, just reiterating that, you know, it, uh, we only want to go uh, apply for guardianship if it is the last and best available choice. All right. So alternatives to guardianship. And so we talked about the two types of guardianship, uh, guardianship of the estates, only if there's assets that need to be protected. If there aren't assets, and it may just be a guardianship of the person. So that person needs uh, someone appointed to consent to medical treatment for them, help them with supports and services and their activities of daily living and all of that. Mm -hmm. So if there are assets, there are some ways to avoid guardianship of the estate. One way is a special needs trust. And so that could be that you're taking the assets of the individual and putting them into a special needs trust so that they um, have a trustee and they aren't controlling those assets. Um, Establishing joint bank accounts, that really only applies if those joint bank accounts were established prior to the incapacity. So sometimes with elderly people, if spouses have a joint account, they may not need a guardianship if one of them becomes incapacitated because the other spouse has control of that account. Um, the next one, that designating a rep payee for SSI, you do not have to have a guardianship to be, uh, you don't have to be the guardian to be the representative payee. So there does not have to be a guardianship set up in order to designate a representative payee. That's something you can do without a guardianship. So that person could control the SSI funds. And so when we're- One thing I want to mention on that is really important, Heidi, is that a lot of people don't know, but you can designate a successor representative payee with the Social Security Administration. And it is super important because if mom is representative payee and mom passes away, their benefits go on hold until it gets worked out. And there's usually attorneys involved and judges involved. And it's a, it's a time consuming process and it could be nine months or a year before their benefits get restarted and they may, they'll go back and get their back pay, but that didn't help each month whenever you guys weren't getting it. So you can for free, you can designate a successor representative payee. One question that we had in the chat box and Heidi, I don't know the answer to this one is, if you can designate a trust as the rep payee, I think it has to be an individual. I don't think it can be an entity. That's my understanding as well. I think it has to be a person. So you guys can go to the ssa.gov and say designating a re representative payee and it provides you the information on how to designate a successor. Um, but I think that that's just an important thing that everybody forgets. Nobody thinks about it. And then it's, it's, we think about it when somebody's benefits are cut off for nine months at a time while we're trying to work it out. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. And we'll, we should have a little bit of time at the end here to talk a little bit about special needs planning, but that is also the benefit of while you're alive and you're able to set up a plan, it's, it's, makes it a lot easier for people when you're gone and you're not able to speak for what you had intended to be in place. So that's really important what Allison just said about designating your successor rep payee 
Similarly, with your estate planning, we'll get into that a little bit, having your will say everything that I have goes to, you know, whomever. Uh, but if there's anything that goes to this particular person who may be eligible for public benefits, that it goes to a special needs trust that will allow their government benefits to continue to be available to them. So we'll hopefully have a few minutes to talk about that. But let's wrap up some of these alternatives to guardianship. So we talked about guardianship of the estate, guardianship of the person. So the supported decision-making agreement, this came about in the 2015 legislature. Um, it's a really great alternative. This is, of course, Texas specific, but a really great alternative to guardianship that is sort of like having a power of attorney, but it is intended for an individual with an intellectual disability. So it is, and if I have someone in my office and we are talking about a supported decision-making agreement, if the individual can tell me that they understand what, um, what I'm talking about as far as, you know, who, who supports you in making medical decisions. When you go to the doctor, do you want mom, dad, grandparent, supporter? Who is your person that helps you to understand what the options are and helps you to talk to the doctor and helps you make those decisions? And if that individual can indicate to me that that is this person that's here, that that's, you know, their person who helps and supports them, then I think a supported decision-making agreement is a really, really good um, tool for them to be able to name that supporter. And so the document, you, you don't even have to have an attorney to prepare a supported decision-making agreement. You can find these on the Disability Rights Texas website, the ARC website, there's kits online that explain them from a self-advocate point of view, from, um, there's, there's, Spanish language ones, there's a lot of information out there. So seek out that information if this pertains to your situation. Um, but you can, the person with an intellectual disability can name a supporter. And basically what that means is now they have this individual who they have allowed to maybe come in and help them make medical decisions where being an adult over the age of 18, that would not be appropriate for that person to be helping them make medical decisions. But in these instances, it's allowed, you know, by statute that they can name the supporter to help them make those decisions. Um, you know, so a medical power of attorney is there also. Medical power of attorney is really only available if someone has capacity to enter into it and then becomes um, incapacitated and then that agent can make those medical decisions for them. Obviously, that's not the case with someone who turns 18 and they already have an intellectual disability. Heidi, I'm a big fan when we're talking about medical power of attorney and power of attorney to say, hey, you know, I know we're talking about kids with disabilities, but think about power of attorney and medical power of attorney in the event of incapacitated, um, incapacitation of your aging parents or family members or loved ones, your kids that you're sending off to college that are neurotypical, that are 18 years old. Um, those things are important. You know, we've seen, I, we saw a fire at Texas State. We've seen accidents on the way home from college. We've seen mental health crises at college and things like that. So I do, I am a big fan of um, having these documents in place before, you know, before the crisis happens. Um, it's just good, good to have that. So consider yourself, your spouse, your aging parents, your other neurotypical kids, um, all, all good. And, you know, and I, I will say that this is the route. These are the supported decision making agreement in these ways. This is a, a, a route that I took and um, with with my kids. And and I think that the theory was is you know going back to that least restrictive, most appropriate. Where we remain hopeful and optimistic, and we're going to do the least, the least, and we're going to see how it goes. And guess what? been going great we didn't need to make any changes at all and it and you know and it and it was and it was easy so so that was kind of my thought process of you know start something small if if your child fits in that category if you need to up the ante later it's going to be clear clear for the medical professionals the the, the judge the you know guardian ad litem whatever they're doing but at least you have something to start with. And, and that's something to start with is not cost prohibitive of four to $5,000 or something like that as well. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I have so many great clients who come to me and go, I know I would like to do the supported decision-making agreement. It's not possible for my child. And I understand and respect that. It's, it's, it's a difficult um, thing. They've been, you know, raising their child and supporting their child for with significant medical problems for years often. And, you know, the idea of going in front of the judge and having to prove that they're the one that should be appointed guardian almost seems 
laughable. Like who else is going to come in here and do this? And so I just, out of respect to them, I just have to give a shout out to all those parents that are dealing with very serious medical um, issues with their children with intellectual disabilities. So I'm just going to mention this again, because again, we're hearing this all the time on the mental health side. Does medical power of attorney apply to inpatient mental health treatment? What if your adult child declines treatment, but is in a mental health crisis? Um, when when does that POA and that healthcare POA uh, take effect? And can they revoke that? Let's ask about that. So if we have a kid that's adversarial, could they revoke that at any time? Yeah, and that's why those situations are so fraught with difficulty because the mental health um, situation you know, if they ha if the individual has capacity to enter into legal documents, they're just making decisions that are harmful to themselves, but can't seem to do otherwise. Uh, there is not, you know, so a whole lot that the parents or who their loved ones are able to do besides just keep trying to find support for them for their mental health um, or addiction, substance abuse, all the different issues that come up. And and you know, they have capacity and they have the right as an adult to make those decisions good, bad, or otherwise, and there's there's really no way to force someone to make good decisions for themselves, and so often guardianship isn't the answer. Sometimes There are some scenarios where the power of attorney would be helpful, so if they were able to sign that power of attorney and name an agent, and then they were to, you know, be unable to speak for themselves in a medical scenario, then likely their agent could, even if it wasn't a permanent, you know, intellectual disability ongoing, like in the guardianship realm. So those power of attorney documents are pretty helpful. There's also the um, mental health emergency treatment documents where someone, if they are aware that they have mental health issues, they can um, fill out, you know, what kinds of treatment they feel comfortable with, medical intervention and all of that. So they can indicate their wishes in a mental health crisis. And those are important documents too on the mental health side. All right. Okay, let's go through a couple of these alternatives to guardianship, supported decision-making agreements. I know we talked about those a bunch. Um, but it does allow the person with a disability to name a supporter. And so they can support with making life decisions and helping to communicate those to people, such as a medical provider. Um, the next one is... Can I just um, mention here one thing that we've learned? We're, we are domiciled in Texas, and sometimes people um, attend our webinars from other states. So there are things in other states, but not all states in the U.S. have a supported decision-making agreement. So if you are attending from another state, you're going to want to check that out for your state specifically. And it's a great um, item to consider advocating for. So it's a way, you know, look into your advocate uh, advocacy organizations in your state if you don't have supported decision making agreements because they are it's something to push for uh, in my opinion um, another alternative to guardianship is uh, consent to authorize advocacy it's also sometimes known as an educational power of attorney you can find these on the websites that I list on there and on the next slide it shows you a um, an example of what those look like um, and so in that last year of ARD meetings, the Texas um, law states that the students IEP must include a statement um, that they basically they need to be uh, considering guardianship if they're coming up on 18. And then it was amended to say that alternatives to guardianship, such as supported decision making agreements have been discussed with the student, but I'm sometimes I don't think that they actually are. I think what a lot of people hear um, is that, you know, they must go get guardianship for their kids. So it's just important to, to be familiar with the requirement and the understanding that an alternative to guardianship could be available. And it could be that it's a supported decision-making agreement. It might be that educational power of attorney, but those are great alternatives to be able to use on, in, on an ongoing basis to be able to be in the ARD meetings and be assisting with those um, educational decisions without having to get a guardianship in all cases. Um, I list these advocacy initiatives, I kind of touched on that a, a minute ago, that it's just important to see, you know, what initiatives have been successful because you can either for your state or just, you know, moving forward, always considering what kinds of um, advocacy initiatives are being promoted by our advocacy organizations. The ARC is a great one. We've got a lot of great advocacy um, groups here um, in Texas, but those important ones that were made in 2015 in guardianship have really impacted people's lives significantly. 
uh, adding those least, less restrictive alternatives to guardianship, the Ward's Bill of Rights, um, which allows the people under guardianship to understand what their rights are, and also the Supported Decision-Making Agreement Act. And I'm sorry, I need to update my slides. I'm on the Reptile Committee, the Real Estate Probate Trust Law uh, Guardianship Committee, and we were seeking input on some changes to guardianship law last time I did this. So. So just some of the supports, I think, for the lives of individuals with intellectual disabilities that can help get to a place where a supported decision-making decision agreement can be helpful. And so I highly just recommend and encourage people to do person-centered planning if you haven't done that. It was really helpful for me working with my own daughter to kind of shift from a um, fixing kind of mentality of how do I you know, do things to help her navigate the world um, it helped me understand, you know, what is important to her, not just what is important for her. And so just going through those thought processes and, and working on how, how to help her be empowered in her own decision making and also accepting some of the support that she may need. Um, Self-determination of our individuals with uh, intellectual disabilities, giving them the dignity of risk. Um, another really important piece is the letter of intent that, you know, you can write as a parent. So that if something happened to you, you've left a letter to someone to say, you know, this is what's really important to and for this individual, and here's some of the supports that they need in their lives. So just a few things. All right, I'm going to just touch on estate planning and special needs planning just in the last couple of minutes that we have, and then we'll hopefully have time for just a, a couple of minutes of questions. Um, estate planning means, you know, your estate is whatever you have in the bank have a house, whatever your assets are, that's your estate. So estate planning may just be a simple will that just says, you know, at my death, everything goes to my kids or at my death, everything to my spouse. If my spouse isn't living, then everything to my kids. The piece that you add in there with the special needs planning is the special needs trust. That special needs trust is considered exempt if it's holding assets, exempt for the purposes of uh, eligibility for public benefits. So if you're leaving everything in your will to a child with special needs who is eligible for public benefits and they receive those assets, they're automatically going to be knocked off of their public benefits. They'll have to spend down whatever they inherited and then requalify for their public benefits. So the way to avoid that is that what they receive goes to, the, to, to a trustee of a special needs trust. You name who that trustee is and then that protects their benefits. And then some of these other documents. Heidi, didn't we do a, um, I think we did a whole um, presentation on the special needs trust and those type, types of things. And I want to say um, a lot of times we get in these, these meetings and there's so much, there's so much um, information in each topic. Like when we're start, we, we have a whole webinar on letters of intent. Um, you know, special needs trust, um, you know, all of these things that we're talking about, they each have, you know, their own webinar, like ABLE accounts and things like that. You guys can visit that on the YouTube channel on Consolidated Planning Group. And, and we will partner with Heidi again to go deep and wide on the trust. I just want to mention that because sometimes people are like, wait, I need more on that. So we do have more and we will do a whole um, presentation on that again. That sounds great. Yes, that's absolutely true. And sorry if anybody signed on for the special needs planning portion and didn't get enough of that. But even I think the last time we did this, we hit about 50-50 on the two topics. So yeah, there's lots of great information information on Allison's uh, website on each of these each of these items. So I'm happy to answer any other questions in the last couple of minutes. Well, I think, Heidi, you hit on something really big on those beneficiary designations, um, and I know that we talk about that a lot, but it is so critically important, and if you're on here and you've made the mistake of naming your loved one with a disability as a beneficiary, it's a free fix. Well, it's free because you can get a change of beneficiary form for free from HR, or from your life insurance company, or what have you. I mean, you are going to need to have a uh, third party special needs trust and that's definitely not free but a lot of times people ask us because an able account is something else and i know you've got slides on that that they can have money to can't i just leave money to the able account and you absolutely can't why do i need a special needs trust and an able account and because you can't leave like an able account can't be a beneficiary is why you would um, really need to be thinking about that um, that third party special needs trust. But I, I just can't stress the importance of that, um, Heidi, because 
we need to maintain our eligibility for Medicaid, state and federally funded programs. We've got SSI, we've got Medicaid, and some people say, well, what do I care about Medicaid? I have private insurance. Well, all of the waivers, the Medicaid waivers in the state of Texas, HCS, Texas Home Living, Community First Choice, to name a few of them, CLASS, they all require Medicaid eligibility. So if you're wondering why you care about Medicaid, those waivers are why you care about Medicaid, and we always want to maintain that eligibility. Yeah, because we just don't know what healthcare will look like in the future. I don't know what my daughter is going to need in the future, and I know when she turns 18, her income will be limited. And so I know that her eligibility will be based on her income and no longer on our family's income and she will be eligible if she needs it and so I don't want to cut that off not knowing what those needs might be so it's so big um you know those waivers a lot of people say hey we're on the list <laughs> um and and but they don't really even know what the list is for and the list is really designed those waivers are designed to waive off some of the cost of care for caring for a loved one with a disability to keep them in home and community-based services and some of those budgets are up to three hundred and forty thousand dollars a year they might pay for attendant services respite services various therapies so it's really really important well miss bonnie and heidi we are out of time for today i always hate it when we run out of time um, but we've got kelly um uh, excuse me, Heidi with Kelly Hart and um, Attorneys at Law um, on, on the screen, her contact information. You can reach out to her directly about her services. Um, in our slides, we will, um, you guys are going to get a copy of the slides with any links in the slides. They'll have our upcoming webinars um, that you can register for as well and um, a link to be able to schedule an appointment directly. Um, and we always offer free consultations. So it's certainly my pleasure um, to be with all of you today. I, honestly, Bonnie, it's always a pleasure to be back with you and your, your beautiful face with, with us today. So I certainly appreciate it. Heidi, you're amazing as, as usual. And one last thing I want to mention, because there is confusion on this. Heidi is, you know, works in this whole estate planning you know, sector. So when we're having questions about guardianship and special needs trust and wills and powers of attorney, supported decision making agreement, she's your girl. When it comes to I'm, a, I'm getting divorced and I, I need a divorce attorney, um, maybe one that's nuanced in special needs, Heidi's going to be a good person to contact to get a referral for somebody in your area for that. You can contact us as well. But Heidi's firm, they're not, they're not doing divorce. And, and I think there's a lot of confusion on what attorney's roles are in, in that space. Um, can, you, can you just touch on that really quick, Heidi? Yeah, and I'm always happy to help uh, give referrals out to the appropriate place. But yeah, well, I, I don't do family law. I do handle child support special needs trust in conjunction with family law attorneys. If they're they're filing a modification or a divorce decree or a suit affecting parent-child relationship, I provide the special needs planning kind of portion of that. And so we work really well hand in hand in that regard. But um, yeah, I'm always happy to just try to push people in the right direction. Um, because it, yes, it, we have some overlapping fields and so it sometimes can be confusing, but yeah. Thanks everyone. It's been, a, a, it's awesome. been great. And I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Likewise. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.